Hi, I'm Chris, and in this tutorial, we'll be going over how to create a 2D adventure game using Unity and Adventure Creator. If you've seen previous versions of this tutorial, uh, this one's going to be a little bit different because we're going to uh, start this tutorial by making a first person 2D adventure game. And that means that it will be a lot quicker to get up and running uh, with hotspots and inventory items and game logic and so on. And then once we have a game up and running, we're going to add a player character that we can use point and click to have move around the scene. Adventure Creator can be gotten on the Unity Asset Store, and assets can then be imported from Window Package Manager. So from here I'll click Import. And then when it's finished compiling the scripts, it'll give us this installation box, just telling us about uh, some inputs and layers that it wants to create. I'll click on OK to do that automatically. And then when it's finished, we can see that we've got Adventure Creator as a new option in the top toolbar. And we can test out that everything's installed properly by going to Getting Started and then Load 2D Demo. And then we can then run this scene to test out the demo. This demo is going to use the same assets as I'm going to in this tutorial, but you can use your own sprites if you choose. Loading up the 2D demo has also opened up uh, the AC Game Editor window, and this is the, the main part of Adventure Creator. And if we manage to lose this, we can always bring it back just by going back up to that top toolbar and choosing Editors, Game Editor. You can see in this Game Editor window, we've got a series of eight tabs, and each of these tabs relates to a different aspect of our game. So for example, the Inventory tab, or Inventory Manager, relates to all of the items that our player might carry. The Settings Manager has all of our game-wide settings in it. And you can also see that each of these managers uh, has an asset file related to this 2D demo. So what we're going to need to do as our first step to creating a game is to make a new set of these managers. We can do this by going back up to this top toolbar and choosing Adventure Creator, Getting Started, and then New Game Wizard. I'll choose Next, and then I'll be prompted to enter in a game name. So I'll try uh, uh, My 2D Game. On the next page, we'll be asked what kind of camera perspective we want. We're going to be making a 2D game Next comes Interface, and this relates to how exactly we click on uh, interactive areas in the scene. I'll try to cover these briefly as we go, but for now we'll just go with Context Sensitive, uh, which basically relates to a one-button interface. Choosing Next again, we then get our GUI system, and this relates to the kind of menus that we have on screen. Default AC will give us a starting set of things like the Inventory menu, a way to pause and save the game. We can also use default Unity UI, but actually these two are interchangeable because we can switch back and forth at any time. Choosing Next again, we'll then just get a list to confirm all of our choices. We also have this movement method field, uh, which relates to how we can move our player character around. For the moment, we're not going to be having a player character on screen, so I'll change this instead to None. If I then click Finish, it will just take a few moments to generate these managers. And if we now look back in our AC Game Editor, we've now got uh, My 2D Game variants of all of these managers. These managers are all sitting inside a subfolder inside My 2D Game. And beside it, we've also got this My 2D Game Manager package file. And this is just a handy way to reassign all of these managers if they get changed. So for example, if I go back to the, uh, the 2D demo, you can see this is now set back to Demo 2D Settings Manager. I can just double click on this Manager Package file, and this will just reassign our own managers back in this window. Let's go ahead and create a new scene. I can go to File, New Scene, and I'll go with a basic 2D built-in scene. Adventure Creator also works with uh, the render pipelines, so if you're using Unity's universal render pipeline, that'll work for a 2D game as well. Again, I'm going to be using the 2D demos assets, 
which I can find in Adventure Creator, 2D Demo, Graphics, Sprites, and then Park. And here are a bunch of textures that are set to be sprites. And if I click on one of these, for example, uh, we have a texture type in its inspector set to sprite. And this means that if we go to the scene window, enable 2D mode, we can just start dragging some of these sprites into the scene. Since we're dealing with multiple sprites for our background, it's important to keep everything ordered correctly. So with the park sky, we're going to have this uh, be displayed underneath everything else. So I'll go to its sprite render and just reduce its order and layer. The ground here is also going to be underneath all of our character and props. So I'll give this a slightly less negative order and layer, just so that everything else can have an order and layer of zero. Next, I'll fix up the camera. So I'll select the main camera and with the game window selected, I'll just reduce the orthographic size a little bit and maybe lower it down a little bit as well. Next, I'll save by going to File, Save As and just name this uh, New Park. And then I'll make sure that this is added to Unity's build by going to File, Build Settings, and then click Add Open Scenes. I'll also clear the sample scene from this list. And this will make sure that when we build our game, uh, this new park scene is the first one that gets run. With the camera and background sprites, we're now ready to turn this scene into an adventure creator scene. And we can do that by going to our AC Game Editor, finding the Scene Manager, and then clicking either with folders or without folders to organize our scene. Folders are really just empty game objects that we can use to help keep things organized, but actually I'll choose without folders here. And you can see in our hierarchy, we've had added a player start 2D arrow. That's this here. And this will determine where the player character starts when we begin this scene. And we also have a game engine object. And this is what Adventure Creator needs in order to run. So as a very basic introduction to how Adventure Creator's scripting system works, let's create a very simple opening cutscene. Now that we've organized our scene objects, the scene manager has populated itself uh, with everything else. And if we look inside scene cutscenes, we've got this on start field and currently it's set to none. So if I click on create, it'll make for us an on start object. And this is a cutscene. And if we look to the right of it in the hierarchy, uh, we've got this node icon here. And if I click on that, it'll bring up the action list editor. And this is Adventure Creator's visual scripting system. So if I dock that and then have a look at what we've got, uh, we've got this engine wait action, which is the default, but I'm gonna change this to have the camera fade in slowly over time. I can do that by changing the action type to camera and then fade. The type we'll leave as fade in. We'll fade in over about, say, just a second. And I'll check wait until finish so that gameplay only begins once this action list has finished. If we now run the scene, you'll see that we have this nice fade in. Our cursor has this uh, default pointer over it, and we can see the default interface. Going up to the top, we have the inventory bar. And if I go down to the bottom left here, I can click on menu to bring up the default pause menu where we can access options and save and load our game. Let's take things a little bit further and play some music when the scene begins. And if we go back to our on start cutscene, we can create a new action by holding down the mouse over this bottom socket here and dragging out uh, and releasing to create a new action in some empty space. This time, Let's use a sound play music action, which at the moment isn't going to be showing much. Uh, we've just got this music storage window button, but we can click that to bring up this window in which we can define all music tracks that our game can play. So I'll click add new clip here, and then I can assign an audio clip. The 2D demo has some music of its own, so let's just recycle that. We can find it in 2D demo audio and then music. If we now close this window and go back to our action, 
we now have a music track field that we can use to select this track from the dropdown. And if we run the game again, that music will be playing. Since I'm recording, I've actually got my, uh, my audio muted up in the top right corner here, but if you're following along, you should be able to hear music at this point. Let's start to make this scene interactive by adding a few props that we can click on. If we go back to the park folder, let's add in the park bench, put it on the right here, and take the park tree and put it over here on the left. Let's start with the bench. And to make something interactive, we need to add a hotspot. And a hotspot represents the clickable area of the screen. We can add a hotspot by going to the Scene Manager, and then scrolling down we have a list of scene prefabs, so I'll click on Hotspot 2D, and this will add a new hotspot into our hierarchy. I'll name it uh, Hotspot 2D Bench, and this yellow square represents the clickable area. So I'll rotate it and stretch it out so that it roughly covers the, uh, the bench. And then if we go to its inspector, we can see how this hotspot is going to be interactive. First of all, I'll set the label, if not name, to bench. And this refers to the label that will appear above it when we hover over it. And then to make it interactive, we can click uh, the plus icon beside use interactions. And here we can define what kind of interaction it's going to be. So its cursor is going to be set to use and here we have a list of default icons that we can make use of. But the main field here is this interaction here, and at the moment it's set to none because this is going to be a separate game object, and I can click on Create to create and assign this bench use interaction object. I'll just tidy things up by making it a child of the hotspot game object, and you can see it's got a node icon just like the onstart cutscene. So when we use this bench, I'm going to have the, uh, the player say something. So this will be a dialogue play speech in which the player says, uh, I don't have time to sit. I checked player line, uh, although we don't actually have a player character yet. So at the moment, this will just represent narration, but it just means that we don't have to go and update these lines once we have a player character. If we test out our progress, after fading in, we can hover over the bench to, uh, to get the label, and we can left click to have that player text come up as subtitles. We can tweak this interface a little bit. Uh, you can see when we hover over the, the bench here, we don't have any indication about what kind of interaction it's going to be. And we can change this by going to the cursor manager and underneath the Interaction Icons panel, which is where all of the various interaction types are defined, I can check Change Cursor based on Interaction. We can see that the cursor then changes to the icon we set in the hotspot. We can also have this Use verb appear in front of the word Bench. If we go up a little bit further, and inside the Hotspot Cursor panel, I can check Prefix Cursor Labels, and that means we have the verb appearing in front of the label as well. If we go back to the bench, we can also set an examine interaction. So again, I'll click on the plus icon, create a new interaction. And this one will be a dialogue play speech as well, in which we just say something like a nice place to sit. Testing progress again. You can see that we now have two icons hover over, and this is because we have a left click to use the bench and a right click to examine it. We don't have to have two icons showing side by side. Again, we can change this by going to the cursor manager and scrolling down to the bottom here. We have when use and examine interactions are both available. I can set this to just display use icon. Let's make the tree over here a hotspot as well. And rather than adding the hotspot from the scene manager this time, let's do it just by adding the component directly to the sprite itself. So with the park tree selected, I can go to its inspector and choose add component, adventure creator, 
hotspot and then hotspot. We also need to define the clickable area of this tree and we can do that with a collider. We could use a 2D box collider or we can make use of a polygon collider 2D instead. And if we do this, then Unity will wrap the collider around the shape of the sprite automatically. And then I'll just check is trigger to make sure that this doesn't interfere with any physics we might have later on. Going back to the hotspot component, I'll set the label to tree and make a new use interaction for it. Uh, let's say this time we have a, a talk to interaction. And again, we'll do a dialog play speech uh, where we just say it's not in a talking mood. Going back to our hotspot inspector for this tree, we can actually define multiple use interactions uh, for any hotspot. So let's go and create a use interaction now. Uh, so for example, tree use, and this will be uh, a speech that results in the line uh, I can't climb trees. Let's test this out now. And if we hover over the tree hotspot, you'll see that we get the, uh, the talk to tree icon come up. And that's because that's the first defined use interaction that we have. So we can click to talk to the tree, but we're not able to run this second interaction that we've just made. If we want to do that, we have to rely on a different interaction method. We can find our interaction method inside the settings manager and underneath interface settings, we have an interaction method set to context sensitive. And this means we'll have a simple one button interface where we can left click to use a hotspot and right click to examine. The other options are a bit more complex, but they allow us to interact with hotspots in more than one way. For example, choose hotspot, then interaction will mean that we can left click on a hotspot to bring up an interaction menu showing all of the icons that we can use it with. So if I click on the bench, I've got this use bench option. And if I click on the tree, I've got a use and a talk to option. This mode has a few other options. For example, we can choose uh, cycling cursor and clicking hotspot, which means that we can right click uh, through the various interactions while we're hovering over a hotspot. The other main interaction method is choose interaction, then hotspot, which means we can click from a menu of icons and then choose the hotspot that we want to use it with. To make such a menu, we can go to the menu manager, or we can actually make use of a downloadable template if we go to Adventure Creator, Online Resources, and then Downloads, Scrolling down a little ways, we have this UI template nine verbs package, and this will give us a pretty faithful recreation of the kind of interface that the old LucasArts classic adventure games had. With this mode, we can also right click to cycle through the various icons. And I can do this by going to the cursor manager and then checking cycle interactions with right click. So with this, I can now right click through my various cursor modes and then choose the hotspots that we want to interact with. To keep things simple though, I'm going to set the interaction method back to context sensitive. Regardless of which method we use, at the moment we only have three icons that we can choose from. We have talk to, use, and then look at. So let's go and make a new one that we can use whenever we want to have a exit in our scene. If we go to the cursor manager, and then scroll down to the list of interaction icons. I can click create new icon and then give it a label of exit. And for a texture, I'll just choose uh, maybe this arrow down texture that comes with AC. As an example for this, let's go to the scene manager and I'll create a new hotspot. I call this hotspot to the exit. And then maybe move it down to the bottom here, stretch it out. Uh, like so. And then in its inspector, I'll create a new use interaction. And this time we can set the cursor icon field to exit. Remembering that the, uh, the syntax of the hotspot label is going to be the verb and then the name of the hotspot, I'll set the label to uh, to 
street. Imagining that we have a, a street scene in our game. Let's actually create the action list for that. So if we go and make a new interaction, as a first action, we might want to fade out the camera. So I'll create a camera fade action, setting the type to fade out and check wait until finish. And in the case of uh, switching to another scene, we can use the scene switch action. And here we can define which scene we want to switch to. And we can do it either by build index number or by file name, just making sure that whichever scene we reference has to be listed in the build settings. As we don't have any other scenes for this tutorial, I'm going to instead have this end the game. So I'll go to engine end game. And if we now test things out, we can hover over the bottom of the screen to be told we can exit to street. And if I click, we'll fade out and then end the game. Let's start to make our scene a little bit more dynamic uh, by having an object in it that we can pick up and carry around in our inventory. As part of the 2D demo, uh, we've got this uh, these worm graphics. So we've got this icon here and a couple of sprites. We can define any items that the player can carry inside the inventory manager. And this manager lets us define a few other things uh, like documents, objectives, and so on. But here we're just going to focus on the items tab. And here I can click create new item. And this will be the worm. So I'll give it the name worm. Set the main graphic to worm icon. And since we're here, I'll make another item as well. So I'll create a new item, set the name to lunch. And we actually have a lunch texture uh, here as well. This time though, I'm going to check carry on start. And so if we run the scene, you can see that we can then access this uh, from the top. Since the worm isn't in our inventory to begin with though, let's add the worm to the scene. And if I find our worm sprite again, I can drop him on the ground somewhere around here. And as before, I'm going to add components to it directly. So I'll add the component uh, hotspot, giving it a label of worm. And this time I'll just add a standard box collider. I'll create a new use interaction for it. And we'll begin this with an inventory add or remove action in which we add the worm. We're also going to want to remove this from view. Uh, now we could just delete the object, but this can cause complications when it comes to the save game system, although it is possible, but generally it is a lot easier to simply hide it from view. And we can do that by just teleporting the whole worm object, uh, maybe down here. This can be done with the object teleport action. The object to move is going to be our worm sprite. And then we need to assign a marker to represent where we want to teleport to. A marker is similar to this blue player start here in that it's just an arrow in the scene. We can create a new one by going to the scene manager and then clicking on marker 2D. I'll name this marker um, hidden. And then move it down so that it's out of view. Going back to this worm use interaction, I'll set the teleport to, uh, to this marker hidden. And then testing the game out, we'll find that we can hover over the worm, click on it, and then have it appear in the inventory. So now that we have one or two items in our inventory, let's create some interactions for them. If we go back to our tree hotspot, uh, we can make an interaction for when we use the worm on the tree. And we can do that from the hotspot component, and this time creating an inventory interaction. So similar to before, I can click on plus and then choose an inventory item. So we'll go with worm, create a new interaction action list. 
And this time we'll get a response from the player uh, saying worms don't like trees, I think. In context sensitive interaction mode, uh, we can use items just by clicking on them and then clicking on the hotspot. And it's the same for using items on each other as well. So let's go and make an interaction uh, for using the worm with the lunch. We can do this by going back to the inventory manager. I'll select lunch and then scrolling down we have a list of combine interactions. I can click add to create a new one and then as with the hotspot we choose what item we want to use and this time we have a action list asset field and this is similar to the interactions we've been working with before only it exists as an asset file. So I can click on create and we have this lunch combine worm asset. And if I double click on that, it'll bring up our familiar action list editor. We'll have yet another dialogue and have the, uh, the player say, um, I don't want that for lunch. Now this is an interaction we've defined for lunch. So it'll run if we click on the worm and then click on lunch. If we want to have this be the same for the reverse, so that we click on lunch and then the worm, we can automate this by going to the settings manager and underneath inventory settings, I can check combined interactions work in reverse. And testing this out now, I'll pick up the worm and then I can use it uh, both on the lunch and the reverse. Let's also just make a quick note of the hotspot label here. So as we click on the worm and then move it over to, for example, this tree, we're back to just having the hotspot name appear. If we go back to the cursor manager and this time underneath inventory cursor, we can set the when inventory selected field to change cursor and hotspot label. And that'll mean that we then get this use worm on tree syntax instead. I made a brief mention of AC's save system earlier, so let's go into that now. If we run the game using Adventure Creator's default menus, we can access the save and load menus uh, by pressing escape or by clicking the menu button to the bottom left. And we can save at any time so long as it's during gameplay. So let's close this for a moment, pick up the worm and then go back and save. We'll need to have a quick understanding of exactly how Adventure Creator's save system works. And what Adventure Creator does is by default, it will only save exactly what it knows that it needs to. And that'll include things like what scene we're currently in and what inventory items we've got, but it doesn't extend to scene objects. So after restarting play mode, we've got the worm back on the ground and no longer in our inventory. And I'm going to go to menu, load, and then load that save game we made after we picked up the worm. And once that's been loaded, uh, we can see that we've now got the worm back in our inventory, but it is still visible here in the scene. To make this work correctly, we need to tell Adventure Creator that this worm sprite's position needs to be included in our save game file. And we can do this by attaching a remember component to it. If we select the worm sprite, go to its inspector, and at the bottom I'll choose add component, and if we go to adventure creator, save system, we'll then get a list of all the remember components that we can use. And the one we want in this case is remember transform, because this will save all of the transform values, including the position of the object it attached to. So to demonstrate this, um, I'll go into play mode. I'll create a new save uh, before we've picked up the worm. Take the worm so that it's in our inventory and then create a new save. And we can then go back and forth between these two save games and the worm's position is restored correctly. 
Now, when dealing with a proper project, uh, it might be the case that it's just too cumbersome to remember to go in and add the correct remember component. But Adventure Creator can actually automate this for us as well. To demonstrate this, I'll go and remove the remember transform component, save the scene, and then we can go to the settings manager. And up the top, we have save game settings. And then I can click on this auto add save components to game objects button. And if I do that and then say OK to the prompt, Adventure Creator will then go through all of the scenes in our build settings and try to flag up each object with the right component. So if we go back to our worm sprite, you can see that it's added the remember transform component. And this automation works pretty well so long as we're manipulating objects through actions. And it's really just a case of having to go and click this button whenever we've added objects that may affect the save game system. Aside from static scenery that we can click on and inventory items that we can pick up, the next most common uh, aspect of adventure games are NPCs. So let's go and make a character uh, that we can talk to. The 2D demos sprites feature a bird. So we're going to use, uh, let's say, one of these bird animation sprites here as the basis for our NPC. I'll drop him into the scene here. And then to convert him into a character, we're going to use Adventure Creator's Character Wizard. We can do this by going to Adventure Creator, Editors, and then Character Wizard. And then, like the new game wizard, it's really just a case of filling in the details. So I'll choose Next, and I'll say that this is going to be an NPC. We can give him a name. Uh, I'll call him, say, uh, Barry. And then we need to assign his renderer object. And in the case of this bird, it's just his sprite renderer. So I'll assign that here. Next again, we then choose the animation engine for this character. And it's auto detected that this is going to be for a 2D character. So it's suggesting to us uh, sprites unity. And this option works by having animations be played according to a naming convention. We'll go into more detail in this when we go over a player character. But in this case, we'll go with Sprite's Unity Complex. Uh, don't be fooled by the name if you're used to Unity's animation system. It really just means that we're going to be making use of Unity's own animator transition and parameter features. Choosing Next again and then Finish, we'll then find that our character has been made. So we have Barry here, and if we expand him, we've got our bird sprite now as a child object. And this object has the hotspot and a collider. And on the root, we also have a further collider and the NPC component. If I keep this root selected and just move this object out of the way for a minute, uh, we can see that the box collider uh, is a little bit too big. So I'll select the sprite, edit the collider, and just bring that down. And it is important when we position a character, we do so by moving the root object and not by moving the uh, the sprite itself. The sprite should always have a local position of 0, 0, 0. So going back to the root, I'll pick him up and perch him over on the bench here. And now let's look into his animations. So in the, uh, the 2D Demos animations folder, we have a few animations already set up. These all animate the sprite that the animator will be attached to. Again, if you want to make use of your own animations, you can do so, but I'm going to be using the bird idle and bird talk animations. So we'll keep things very simple. And what I'm going to do next is create a new animator controller to play them. So going back to my My2D game folder, I'll right click, choose create, and then animator controller. I'll just name it bird. I can assign this onto our NPC by selecting his sprite object and then dropping the asset into the animator's controller field. I'll double click to open up the animator window for him. And then going back to these animations that I was mentioning, I'll drop in bird idle, which I'll leave as the default and bird talk. We're not going to have our bird moving around, so we're not going to worry about um, different directions and walking or flying animations or anything like that. We're just going to keep things very simple. All we're going to do is have a transition from idle to talk and back again 
based on a bool parameter. I can create a bool parameter by clicking the plus and then bool. I'll name this is talking. And then right clicking on the idle state, choose make transition to the talk. I'll uncheck has exit time and remove the transition duration. And then just give it a condition of is talking to true. For the reverse, I'll just do the opposite. And we now just need to tell Adventure Creator that it can manipulate this parameter based on whether or not the bird is actually talking. We can do that by going to the NPC component. And if you look inside the, uh, the top, we have our animation settings and then mechanism parameters, which are showing because of our chosen animation engine. And you can see a list of parameter names uh, that we can optionally assign and have Adventure Creator take control over. So for example, we have a move speed float. So if we had a, a parameter named speed in our controller, then Adventure Creator would set that to the character's speed at runtime. For this bird though, we are only going to be having an is talking bool. So I can remove all of these. And you can see the talk bool field is already set to is talking. We can test out this animation by having a simple interaction that has the bird say something. So if I go back to our sprite child, uh, go down to hotspot, I'll create a new use interaction uh, of the type talk to. And in this interaction, for the moment, I'll just have a dialogue play speech. The speaker this time is going to be our bird, Barry. And he'll just say something like, uh, uh, squawk, I'm, Barry. Testing this out, uh, we can click on Barry to have him speak, and his animation uh, plays while it's doing so. We can actually see this uh, in his animator. If we select his sprite object and keep the animator window open, we can see the transition from idle to talk as he starts speaking. Let's now make our interaction with Barry a little bit more interesting and give the player a set of dialogue options that they can choose from. We can do this with a conversation object, and we can create that by going to the scene manager, scrolling down and clicking conversation. I'll name this uh, Barry conversation. And if we look at its inspector, we can add new dialogue options just by clicking the button here. I'll create three of them. And for each, we can give a label that will appear on screen. So for the first, I'll type, wow, a talking bird. We might want to offer him some food. So for the second, I'll set to, are you hungry? And the third one, I'll set to later Barry. Let's run this conversation as part of our NPC's interaction. And we can do this by creating a dialogue start conversation. I'll set the conversation to Barry conversation, and this will cause the options to show on screen. In terms of what happens when we click on an option, there's a couple of ways we can handle that. One of them is to assign each dialogue option its own action list, but the more convenient way is to simply run all of the responses uh, in the same action list that begins the conversation. And we can do that by just checking override options. And you can see our action now has three output sockets that are each associated with a different response. So if I want to set the actions for wow, a talking bird, I can drag a wire out of the socket and start building my actions. So I'll begin by having the player actually say this line, which will then follow with a response from Barry. So let's have him say something like, um, well, it is a game. And to then re-show the dialogue options after this, we just need to reroute the action list back onto this dialogue start conversation action. I can marquee select multiple actions to move them out the way. And then I can have a look at this second line. 
So if we choose, are you hungry? I'll start by having the player say exactly that. To which Barry will say something like, um, sure am, I love me some worms. Again, we'll reroute back onto the conversation action. And if we choose later Barry, and have Barry bid us farewell, we can end the conversation just by having the action list end here. Let's test things out. And now when we interact with him, we get this conversation menu and choosing any of the options runs that response. Our action list is getting a bit cluttered now. We can make things a lot neater just by clicking auto arrange up at the top right. And let's now make our conversation a little bit more dynamic by having the middle option, are you hungry, only be available when we've chosen the first option. So what we first need to do is hide the middle option. And we can do this by going back to the conversation inspector. I'll select, are you hungry? And uncheck is enabled. And then to have this show after we've chosen the first option, we can go to the, uh, the bottom of the first options chain here. I'll choose insert after to create a new action. And this one will be a dialogue toggle option action. The conversation, again, will be Barry conversation. The option we're going to affect is are you hungry, which we'll set to on. And if we now test this out, we can interact with the bird. We only have two options, but if we choose the first one, we're then presented with a third one as well. You can see where we're going with this tutorial because we have a worm on the ground that we can pick up and a bird NPC that wants to eat it. Let's go and make an inventory interaction for Barry the bird. We can go back to his hotspot on his sprite object and create a new inventory interaction. The inventory is going to be the worm and I'll create an interaction and to begin with we'll just keep things quite simple. So I'll use a dialogue play speech in which the player says, here you go. At which point we'll then remove the item from our inventory. We can do this with inventory add or remove, setting the method to remove and the item to remove as worm. Then we'll just have Barry say something like, uh, nice one. Thanks. If we test our progress, we can pick up the worm here, select it from the inventory menu, use it on Barry the bird, and have it removed from the item bar. But if we now go and click on him and run the conversation, we can see that when we run the second option, we can ask him if he's hungry, but Barry still tells us that he is. So what we'll do is give Barry a different response in the event that we've already given him the worm. To do that, we're going to make use of a variable. And if you're new to scripting or game logic, a variable is basically a way of keeping track of changes that have happened to our game. And in the case of Barry the bird here, we want to know whether or not we've given him the worm. There are a few ways we can store variables depending on how we want to be able to access them. But in the case of Barry the bird here, we're just going to attach them directly to his game object. So I'll select Barry's root, scroll down and click add component and choose adventure creator, logic, and then variables. In this component, I'll then choose create new component variable. And you can see the properties for it as I've done so. We'll set the label to um, has been fed and this is going to be of type boolean, and its initial value is false. We're going to want to update this variable when we give him the worm. So going back to his Barry worm interaction, I'll go to the bottom and then add a new variable set action. 
We'll then get a source field. In this case, we're using a component variable. And the component is on Barry. And with that assigned, we can now access the has been fed variable. And here we're going to set it to true. So now that we have this variable keeping track of this state, we can use it to update Barry's conversation. So I'll now go to our talk to interaction and finding the action branch uh, for our middle option, are you hungry? In between our two speech lines, I'll insert a new action. And this time it will be a variable check action. Again, we need to choose a source and it's going to be a component variable. So I'll set it like before. And this time we're able to check whether or not has been fed is equal to true. We want Barry to tell us that he's hungry only if we haven't. So we'll run this existing speech if the condition is not met. If the condition is met, that means Barry is no longer hungry. So we can create a new action here in which he says, nah, I'm full. And as before, we'll have this reroute back to the dialogue start conversation action. As a test, let's begin by talking to Barry. We'll access the second option. And he tells us that he is hungry. Coming out of the conversation, we'll pick up the worm, give it to Barry. And if we now ask him if he's still hungry, we find that he's not. Finally, we'll update the scene to work with our save system. And that's because we have this variables component that's part of the scene and has a value that's going to be changing. And to do that, we just need to add the correct remember component. And in this case, it's going to be the remember variables. Now that we've started to build up our gameplay, let's turn our attention to the camera system. First of all, we can go into aspect ratios and particularly for 2D games, when art is very often drawn for a particular aspect ratio, it might be the case that we want to lock uh, the camera aspect ratio uh, regardless of what the actual game resolution is. So for example, if our artwork is 16 by nine, but the game window is one by one, we can correct this by going to the settings manager and at the bottom underneath camera settings, I can set aspect ratio to fixed and then give an aspect ratio of uh, 1.667. And if the game is then run in the window that's different from that, we'll then get these black borders around the edges. When it comes to actually having our camera move in the scene, Adventure Creator works by having a single main camera uh, do all of the rendering, but uses something called a game camera as a reference for its position. At the moment, we don't have any game cameras, and so the main camera remains fixed. But if we want to do any movement, we first have to assign a default camera. We can do that from the scene manager and up at the top, we have a field for default camera. So I'll click on create to create and assign this. We have this nav cam one. And if I select this and go into the scene view, I'll quickly come out of 2D mode and just pull the camera back and maybe raise the orthographic size to match that of our current main camera. At runtime, this camera will then be used as a reference for the main camera and won't actually be doing any rendering itself. But now that we have this assigned, it means we can easily transition to other cameras back and forth. So let's have it so that when we talk to the bird, uh, we zoom in the camera a little bit to focus more on this bench. To do this, we'll go back to our scene manager and at the bottom, we can create a new game camera 2D and I'll rename this uh, bird. And then going back into scene view, I'll bring it back, move it down a little bit and lower its orthographic size. So we're a bit more zoomed in. To have this camera become active while we're talking to the bird, I'll make some changes to the Barry talk to interaction. And we're going to make use of a camera switch action. So in some empty space, I'll right click and choose add new action. 
and then set this to camera switch. The new camera is going to be our bird camera. And we'll set a transition time of maybe um, two seconds. I'm going to want this camera switch to run first. So I can click on its cog and then choose move to front and then click auto arrange. Finally, we'll do the same thing at the end of the conversation. So if I scroll down to the end of the, uh, the third dialogue option where we say goodbye to the bird, I'll create another camera switch action. This time we can either set the new camera directly to navcam1 or we can just check return to last gameplay. Either way, I'll set the transition time back to two seconds and maybe I'll check wait until finish uh, with a smooth movement method. Let's go about creating a score system so that the player has an idea of how well they're doing in the game. Having scores in adventure games are a little bit of an old fashioned mechanic, but they're a good way to demonstrate concepts like parameters, variables, and menus. To keep score, we're going to make use of an integer variable. And the variable we used before on Barry was simply a component attached to Barry's root. That's fine in this case, because this is a variable we only need to access while we're in this scene. But for something like a game score, we're going to want to be able to access it all across the game. And so for that, we're going to use a global variable. We can access global variables by going to the variables manager and then clicking the global tab. Right now we have none, so I'll create a new one by clicking create new global variable. I'll set the label to score, the type to integer, and I'll leave the initial value as zero. Let's now create an action list that increases this score up to a maximum value and maybe plays a little sound as well. In my project folder, I'll right click and choose create adventure creator action list. And I'll name this increase score. If I double click on it to open up the action list editor for it, we'll start with a variable set action. The source is going to be global this time. The variable will be score and the method is going to be increase by value. And I'll increase the value by, for example, 10. We want to make sure that the score has a maximum value of, let's say, 250. So what we can do is follow this up with a variable check action in which we check that the score is more than 250. And if it is, we're going to set it to 250. So if the condition is met, I'll create a new variable set action in which we set the score to 250. We might want to have some sound as well. And we can do that either with the sound play or play one shot actions. I'll choose sound play one shot and choose the clip to play. I'll just pick a sound from the 2D demo, uh, for example, bird squawk here. And the other fields I'll leave alone because they're optional. But I'll make it so that this sound always plays by rerouting the if condition is not met socket for our variable check onto this action as well. Creating these actions inside an action list asset file means we can run them at any time. So for example, we might want the score to go up when we give the worm to Barry. So inside my Barry worm interaction, I'll go to the bottom and make a new action. And this one is going to be an action list run action in which the source is asset file and the action list asset is increase score. Before we go any further, let's just test this out. Since we don't have a way of showing the score right now, I'm just going to keep the variables manager open and make sure that show runtime values is checked. And this means that the scores value will be shown here. So at the moment it's zero, but if I click on the worm and give it to Barry the bird, it increases to 10. Now, giving a bird to a worm isn't really uh, the biggest puzzle in the world. And so maybe we don't want to give the player that many points. What we could do is create a separate action list to increase the score by a different amount. 
but a much more efficient way is to rely on action list parameters for this. Action list parameters are very similar to function parameters if you're familiar with coding, but they're really just a way of changing action field values at runtime. So let's go back to our increase score action list, and you can see here that we are increasing the score by 10. What we want to do is replace this 10 with whatever we want at the time that we run it. To do that, we can create a new integer parameter, and we can access our parameters by clicking on the properties box uh, at the bottom right of the action list editor. I'll check use parameters and then create new parameter. It's an integer by default, and I'll set the name to score increase. I'll set a default value of 10 again, and then click properties again to hide this box. But if we now go back to our variable set action, we've now got another field just above this 10. And if I click on it, it brings up this drop down that I can use to override the field underneath. So if I click on score increase, that 10 we had before has now disappeared because it's now being set by this parameter. And if you're a little bit confused, don't worry because it'll all make sense when we go back to the Barry Worm interaction. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we've got our action list run action. And if I change now the run mode to set parameters and run, we now have the score increase parameter showing with the default value. We can just type three into this box and still rely on the same increase score asset. But of course, a score isn't much if the player doesn't know about it. So let's update our UI to show how many points we currently have. If we go to the menu manager, we can see a list of all of the menus that make up our interface. And a good one for this might be, say, the inventory menu. Menus can be rendered with either Adventure Creator or by Unity UI. And you can see that in the menu's source properties. Unity UI gives us a lot more styling options, but Adventure Creator is generally a lot faster when it comes to prototyping. So in this case, we'll just stick with that. You can see that this menu is made up of a list of inventory items and two arrows uh, or buttons either side of it. These elements are reflected further down the menu manager. You can see we have a list of elements, uh, the shift left button, the inventory box and shift right. So what we'll do is just reduce this a little bit to make way for a score bar over on the right here. If I click on the inventory box element, I want to reduce the number of possible items we can see, and I can do that by reducing the max number of slots slider. I'll choose about nine. It doesn't really matter too much because we have this shift button that allows us to scroll through our inventory if we're carrying more than nine items. So I can click on this and then go down to its position and then just reduce the X value to shift it over a little bit leftwards. So now we have space for our score here and we're going to display our score in a label. So from the list of element types, I'm going to choose label and then add new. And you can see that's now appeared inside the menu. I want it to appear on the right here. So I'm going to set its position to relative to menu size and then increase the X and Y values. So that it's now showing in the right place. Going up to the top of its properties, I'll set the element name to uh, score label and then we can have a look at the label type field so this one is currently set to normal but we could instead set this to global variable to have it show the score value instead and if we test that out we can go to the top to access the inventory and we see it's currently set to zero and if i use the worm on barry that's then set to three it's not very obvious that this number represents a score though, so let's make that a bit more clear. If we go and change the label type back to normal, we could type in some label text that appears instead. I'll type score x of 250, and all we now need is to replace this x with the value of our score variable. And all we need to do is use the variable's text token. We can get that by going back to the variables properties, 
you can see that we've got this replacement token field that I can right click and choose copy token text. And at runtime, this will be replaced with the variables value. So if we go back to the menu manager and back to this label text field, I'll replace the X with this token. And if we now run the game, we can see that the score is showing correctly. Now that we have a fairly simple puzzle up and running in our little game, let's go and create a player character that we can have on screen and move around by clicking. We've got some graphics, uh, again for this inside the 2D Demos graphics folder, and we have some sprites for the character Brain. If we have a look at this sprite in its inspector, you can see that its pivot point is set to the bottom. And when it comes to character sprites, we need to make sure that their pivot points are at the bottom so that their position in the scene is always by their feet. We also have some animations for them uh, inside the 2D Demos animations folder. So before we go any further, let's just go and have a look at some of these. To play these back, we're going to need an animator controller. So going back to my My2D game folder, I'll create a new animator controller named Brain. And selecting the sprite that I've dropped into the scene, I'm going to add a new animator component and then assign the brain animation controller. If I then double click to open it and I've got the animator window here, I'll go back to the 2D Demos animations folder and I'm just going to select all and then drag them all into the base layer here. And this means that if we then go to the animation window and dock it, with the sprite object selected, I can then preview any of the animations that are in that controller. So for example, we have a walking animation, a side walking animation, various taking animations, and some talking animations as well. So we've got quite a few animations here, and you can see that they all seem to follow this naming convention uh, where they have an underscore at the end followed by capital letters. And these capital letters represent which direction the character is facing in this animation. So for example, brain talk underscore R means that he's going to be facing right while playing his talk animation. Similarly, underscore DL is for down left and so on. And the reason they're all named like this is because Adventure Creator can play these animations back automatically by using this naming convention. We can see how this works once we've created the character. So let's do that now by again, selecting the object, going to Adventure Creator's Character Wizard. This time we are going to be making a player and the game object to work with is going to be this sprite object. Next, we choose the animation engine and this time we will go with the default sprites Unity. Finish up and then we have our new player character. So just as with Barry, the NPC bird, our sprite has been moved into a child object and he's got a player component on his root. If we take a look at his animation settings, uh, these fields are all related to the sprite's Unity animation engine. And rather than entering in animator parameter names, what we instead do is type in the naming convention that we're going to use. So for example, our idle name is going to be, at the moment, just idle. But in our animator, all of our idle animations begin with brain idle in capital letters. So I'm going to go and type this in uh, as our idle name, brain idle. And it's the same thing for his walk animation. So I'll set that to brain walk. Uh, he doesn't have a run animation, so I can clear that. And then his talk animation, is brain talk as well. His facing directions is currently set to four, as in up, down, left, right. But since we have diagonal animations as well, we can set this to eight. And if we then go and check list expected animations here, this will let us know all of the animations that need to be in the animator controller based on the above settings. So you can see we need, for example, brain idle underscore u for up, underscore d for down, and so on. These animations are already in the animator controller. 
so we can just run the scene and see how things are going. If we enter play mode, Brain is now facing upward and he's in the middle of the screen. And this is because of the position and rotation of the default player start. If we come out of play mode and find this player start, you can see that this is the default because it's assigned at the top of the scene manager. So we can select it in the hierarchy, move it down to somewhere a bit more sensible, and maybe turn it so that it's facing diagonally downward as well. At the moment, our player character can't move around, but we can still have him play his talking animations because all of our dialogue play speech actions are set up to use the player. So if we click on Barry here, whenever we choose a line such as this one, you'll see the talk animation then kicks in. A quick note about this player start object. If we have a look at its inspector, you can see that it's got these previous scene activation fields and these are used whenever we start this scene by transitioning from another one. So for example, if we had another scene named maybe Street, we could go to the Scene Manager's navigation panel, create a new player start, name it uh, Player Start Street, position it where we'd want the player to appear from, and then in the inspector, I'd set the Choose Scene By to Name, and then set the previous scene name to street. And that will mean that whenever we switch to this scene from another scene named street, our player character will appear here instead of the default. We're almost ready to start working on navigation, but before we do that, let's just make our player character here a prefab. I can do that by selecting the player from the hierarchy and dropping him into the project folder. Having done this, we can then assign him in the settings manager, so if we go to the top of the settings manager, we have character settings and a player prefab field. And if I assign this new player prefab in that, it's then safe to remove the player from the scene itself. And that'll cause him to be spawned in automatically when we run the game. Now that we have an on-screen player character, let's work on our movement system and the ability to have the player character move around as we click around the scene. The first step to doing this is to create a nav mesh, and a nav mesh is essentially the area of the screen that the player or any character is able to move around. We can do that by going to the scene manager, and you can see up at the top we have a field for default nav mesh, so I can click to create and assign that automatically. If we select this and look at its inspector, we can see that it's got a Polygon Collider 2D component, and that's represented by this pentagon in the middle of the scene. It's the shape of this object that determines where characters will be able to walk, so we'll need to reshape it so that it covers this grassy ground here. We can do that by going to Edit Collider, and then I can just click and drag uh, these points around like so. So I'll just have it cover the grass. On the right side, we have this bench. So I'm going to click uh, along the edges of my collider to create some new vertices and just reshape the nav mesh so that it goes around the bench. We also have this tree over here, but we'll come back to it in a moment. I'll stop editing the collider and then we'll take a look at the settings manager. A little ways down, we've got interface settings and our movement method is currently set to none. If we set this to point and click, we can have the player move around as we click on the screen. So if we try that now, we can click around the scene to have our character move there. Now we've got a few problems, as you'll see, mainly to do with the sprite ordering, uh, and we've also got this tree here that the player is able to move through. So let's go and fix that one now. We can do this by using another collider to carve a hole inside our nav mesh. If I go to game object, create empty, I'll call this um, tree hole. And then looking at its inspector, I'll just clear its transform values and then add a polygon collider of its own. Editing its shape, I'll just move its uh, points around the tree like this.
and then we're ready to assign this as a whole in our regular nav mesh. We can do that by going back to our nav meshes inspector, and inside the navigation mesh component, we've got a nav mesh holes section, and I'll click create new hole, and then assign this tree hole that we've just made. And if we now run the scene and have the player character move to the other side of the tree, he'll now move around it and keep out of the way of this hole. In fact, we can enable gizmos to see the shape embedded as part of this nav mesh. The next major issue we need to fix with our navigation is that of the sprite sorting. And you can see at the moment when the player is overlapping the tree, sometimes he's above it and sometimes he's not. In more recent versions of Unity, uh, we have much better options in the way of sprite sorting, and so the best way to do this is to rely on pivot points. If we select the tree here, we can see a, uh, a circle uh, near the bottom that represents the pivot point of the sprite, and what we can do is have our sprites be ordered according to their relative position of these pivot points uh, along the y-axis, which is vertical. We can see in the sprite renderer component for this tree, our sprite sort point is currently set to center. So I'll change it to pivot and then do the same thing for the bench, as well as our player characters sprite. All of these sprites have an order in layer of zero. And so long as they're all on the same order in layer, they can be sorted along the axis. To make this axis vertical, we can go to Edit, Project Settings, and then up at the top we have this Transparency Sort Mode field, which we can set to Custom Axis, and then fill in the axis values underneath. So we can set this to 0, 1, and then 0 to have it along the y-axis. And if we then play the game, we'll find that uh, Brain is drawn underneath the tree when he's behind it, and on top of it when he's in front. If you're making use of Unity's Universal Render Pipeline, then these camera settings here won't apply, but getting around this is just a case of attaching a simple script to your main camera, and I'll leave a link to such a script underneath this video. Going back to our play mode, we can see that our scene graphics have a little bit of perspective to it, uh, for example this bench, but our player character remains the same size as he moves around the screen. And so it looks like he's actually shrinking when he moves downward and getting bigger as he moves up. What we can do is have Adventure Creator uh, handle this character scaling automatically, and we can do that with a sorting map. Going back to the scene manager, we have a default sorting map field. So I'll create and assign one. I can bring it up in the scene window here, and we want to position this at the top of the nav mesh. So I'll put it around here. And then if we have a look in its inspector, uh, we can see that it's made up of these sorting areas. So I'll create a new area. And you can see we've now got two of these position gizmos. And I'll drag this bottom one here so that it's underneath the bottommost point of the nav mesh. Going back to this sorting map component, we can affect the various ways that it will affect our character. We're using the pivot points to handle sorting. So I'm going to uncheck Affect Character Sorting, but I am going to check Affect Character Size. And this means that we can make use of the scale values here to affect how big our character is as they're moving around the scene. So our Start Scale, uh, which represents the top of the sorting map, is at the moment 100%. So I'll reduce it to say maybe 90. And the scale at the bottom here is represented by this End Scale value. So I'll raise this up to maybe 120, 118, something like that. And it's a little bit subtle, but you can see in the scene window here, the area is actually uh, expanding and shrinking to show this change in scale. So if we run the scene, we can see that our player character will actually get a bit bigger as he moves downward. I think I'll actually have this effect be a little bit more pronounced, and I'll do this by reducing the start scale a little more. You can see that our scene here has some shadow to it. Uh, so underneath the bench and the tree, we've got the grass looking slightly darker. Whereas our character here doesn't have any shadow, 
so it looks like he's sort of floating. We can add a shadow to our character's prefab. If I go to my new player's prefab, we have a shadow sprite that we can find in Adventure Creator's 2D folder, and then graphics, sprites, and then brain. I'll drop brain shadow into his prefab's hierarchy, and then make it a child object of his main sprite. I'm going to want to make sure that this is always drawn underneath our main sprite, so I'll give it an order in layer of minus one, but we'll also need to make sure that it's ordered correctly with our tree and bench sprites. So what we can do is make use of Unity's sorting group component. If I go to our character's main body sprite, I'll add the component sorting group. And with this attached, Unity will then rely on this rather than the sprite renderer to handle ordering. And if we now run the scene to try this out, our character now sits in the scene a little better because he's got this shadow. Now that our navigation is set up, we can rely on our nav mesh for more than just point and clicking. For example, if we click on this tree here, we can have the player walk over to it automatically. And we can do that by creating new markers and assigning them to our hotspots. If we go to our bench hotspot, for example, we've got inside its component a walk to marker field. So I can click on create to create a new marker for this hotspot. With it selected, uh, you can see by default it's appearing in the middle of the hotspot. So I'll just drag it uh, to the bottom left here, say, and turn it a little bit clockwise. If we now go back to our bench hotspot and have a look at our interaction panels, you can see that we've got this player action field, which at the moment is set to do nothing. And I can set this instead to walk to marker to have our player walk over to the bench before running that interaction. If we go to our tree hotspot, uh, instead of making a marker this time, we can instead set our player action to turn to face. And that'll just mean that he changes direction before running the interaction. We can also move characters as part of our action lists. So to demonstrate, I can open up the on start cutscene, create a new action, and make it a character move to point action. I'll check is player and then set the marker to reach as maybe uh, this player start 2D street. Checking wait until finish. And if we then run the scene, our player will move over there as part of the opening cutscene. This was just a quick demonstration though, so I'll come out of play mode and remove that. As a final note regarding navigation, if we double click somewhere in the scene, the player then moves a lot faster. And this is because it's causing him to run. The problem though is that we don't have any running animations. If we did, we could go to our player prefab. We can supply the name of our running animations, but since we don't have any for these sprites, I'm just going to disable the ability to run. And we can do that by going to the AC Game Editor's Settings Manager. Scrolling down to Movement Settings, we then have a field for double click movement. And at the moment, this is set to makes player run. So if I just change this to disabled, it'll mean that we can no longer double click to run. Now that our player is able to move around as we click on the screen, let's make our camera a little bit more dynamic. Our scene's default camera is Navcam 1, and this is active whenever we're pointing and clicking. At the moment, there's not really much room for it to move, so I'll go to its camera component and lower its orthographic size a little bit. And then we can uncheck the two movement locks we have in the Game Camera 2D Inspector. And the best way to set these values is really just to play with them while we're running the game. I'll go to the game window and have this play without maximizing the screen. So the camera is now following the player. And that's because by default, we have target is player checked. But the player's root position is actually by their feet. So the first thing I'm going to do is raise the offset value of the vertical movement panel. Now 
I feel that the camera is a little bit slow to catch up, so what I'm going to do is raise the follow speed, but I still want there to be a bit of leeway so far as how far the player can move from the middle of the screen. And we can do this by raising the track freedom values. So once we're happy with the behavior, we'll then need to just copy these values uh, so that they can survive play mode. We can do this by going to the top right of the Game Camera 2D component and clicking Copy Component, then come out of play mode, go back and this time choose Paste Component Values. Lastly, let's take a look at this Constraint box. And this is unchecked at the moment, which means that when the camera is following its target, in this case the player, it's able to go beyond the boundaries of the scene here. So if I move over to the right here, you can see that we're now seeing this, this blue background. We want to be able to limit the camera to prevent it from going too far. If we check Constrain, we then get minimum and maximum values that we can play around with, but it's easier to just assign a background sprite. If I come out of play mode and have a look in the scene window, you can see that we've got this park sky sprite, which covers the full area of the scene. So I'll go back to my Navcam 1, check Constrain for both my horizontal and vertical movement panels, and assign Park Sky as the background constraint. And this will then mean that when we near the edge of the scene, the camera doesn't go out of bounds. If we take a look at this background we have, we can see that it's looking a little bit sparse. We've only got this, this uh, blue sky here. And now that we have a moving camera, we can add some background sprites that have an illusion of depth. If we go to the 2D Demos graphics folder once again, inside Sprites and then Park, we've got this Park Background Sprite. So I'll place it in the scene here and then lower the ordering value so that it's in between the ground and the sky sprites. At the moment, this is just going to be in a fixed position, but if we want to give it a depth effect, we can do that by going to Add Component, Adventure Creator, MISC, and then Parallax 2D, with higher values making objects feel further away. So I'll set this to 0.5, and then check Scroll in X and Y directions. And as we move around the scene, this background gives us a little bit of a 3D depth effect. Before we go any further, let's update our scene's interactions to make use of the player character that we've now made. We've already updated our bench hotspot with a walk to marker so that the player can walk over there before interacting. Let's do the same thing for our bird NPC, but rather than creating a new marker, I'll just make use of this bench marker that we made earlier. So in the walk to marker field, I'll set the marker to this hotspot 2D bench. And then we can make use of that in the use and inventory interactions by setting the player action to walk to marker and checking face after moving to make sure that the player faces uh, rightwards when he's standing here. For the worm on the ground, we want the player to move over and then play a, a picking up animation. So let's take a look at what animations we can make use of. I'll place the My New Player into the scene, select his sprite which has the animator on it, and then open up the animation window by going to Window, Animation, Animation. And this will allow us to preview any of the animations that are in his animated controller. So we have this Brain Take Ground underscore DR. And if we want to play this as we take the worm, we're going to make sure that the player is to the left of the worm before he does so. I'll remove the player now and then go back to our worm hotspot. I'll create a new walk to marker and then position this so that it's just to the left of the worm and then rotate it uh, so that it's facing down right. And then if we go back to our worm hotspot, set the player action to walk to marker and then face after moving, this will make sure that our player character is facing down right before we do anything else. So we can now update our interaction. So if I click on the node icon for worm use, 
I'll start by creating a new action, and this will be a character animate, in which we animate the player by playing a custom animation named brain take ground underscore dr. And what I'll do first is check wait until finish, and then make this the first action in our list. And if we test our progress, and if we click on the worm, brain will move over, play the animation, and then the worm disappears. When this runs though, the worm only disappears at the end of the animation, and that's because our action list is waiting for our character animate action to finish. To get around this, what we could do is uncheck wait until finish, and then maybe have a delay, but having this option checked means that we can also access this return to idle after option, and this allows us to easily return to the idle state once it's completed. So what I'm going to do is run these different actions uh, at the same time. And we can do that with an action list run in parallel action. This allows us to run separate chains of actions at the same time. And I'm going to set the number of outputs to two, and then make this the first action by choosing move to front. Our first action chain is going to be character animate. And then our second action chain is going to start with a delay. So I'll have an engine wait of say about a second. And then we'll have this reroute to our inventory add or remove and object teleport actions. I don't want these to run after the character animate. So I'll drag out the output socket into some empty space. I think the engine wait of a second is perhaps a little too long, so I'll set it to say 0.6 instead. And if we now see the result this has, we can run the game, click on the worm, and the worm now disappears from view halfway through the animation. Since our little game features a lot of dialogue, let's take a look at the way that subtitles are handled. If we right click to look at the bench, you can see that we've currently got speech scrolling enabled. And this is optional within the speech manager. I can uncheck scroll speech text to cause all text to just display at once. If we do have this enabled though, it means we can rely on text tokens to spread out scrolling. For example, if we go to Barry talk to the interaction that runs when we click on our NPC, you can see that our opening speech is squawk. I'm Barry. And it's here that we can insert a wait token to have a bit of delay between the two sentences. So for example, I can type open bracket, wait, colon, and then a wait time. So for example, a one for one second, close brackets. And if we now run the scene and click on Barry, we'll then get a little bit of a delay, uh, just giving a bit of life to the subtitles. For a more classic 2D style though, what I'm going to do is get rid of speech scrolling and restyle the subtitles menu so that subtitle text appears above the character's heads. We can edit our subtitles menu by going to the menu manager and then clicking on subtitles. And you can see at the top of its list of properties, its source is set to Adventure Creator. And this means that we can both preview it in the game window and edit all of the styling properties directly here in the menu manager. We want to make this menu dynamic so that it appears above the speaking character. And we can do that by changing its position value from manual to above speaking character. We can use this little icon that's appeared as a frame of reference. So if we just imagine that this is a character's head, I can lower the position Y value so that it moves up above it. And then we can work on the styling of the rest of the menu. So next I'll make this menu size itself automatically based on the elements inside it. And I can do that by setting the size to automatic. When it comes to elements, you can see that we've got the name of the character at the top and then the subtitle text itself underneath. I can click either of these in the game window to automatically select that element in the menu manager. And what I'm going to do is hide the name of the speaking character. So I'll select the subs speaker label element and then uncheck is visible. 
Then selecting subs line label, this is the speech text itself. I can set the text alignment to middle center, the size to automatic, and then raise the, uh, the text size a little bit. And we'll also get rid of the background texture. This makes the text a little bit hard to see, but I can get around that by changing the text effect to outline. At the moment, this uses a white font, but what we can also do is have different colors appear based on which character is speaking. We can do this by checking use character text color. And so for example, if we go to our player prefab, we can scroll down the player component and change the speech text color. Let's say for brain, we'll make it a little bit blue and leave it as white for Barry the bird. By default, this menu also has a fade effect when it transitions in and out. And for a more classic feel, we can set this to none. I mentioned also we'll get rid of scrolling speech text. So I can do that by going to the speech manager and unchecking scroll speech text. Let's now run the scene to see our progress. And we can see the new subtitles appear if I click on this bench, for example. And if I talk to Barry here, you can see that each line uses the color of that speaking character. Of course, Unity does have its own UI system. If we go back to our subtitles menu, we can have it instead rely on Unity UI by setting the source to Unity UI prefab. This gets rid of the preview in the game window, and that's because we're relying on a separate UI prefab for the rendering. All of the default interfaces menus already have such a prefab, and you can see this assigned at the bottom here. We have this linked canvas prefab that is currently mapped to subtitles UI. And if I double click on it, we can view it in prefab mode. So if we wanted to make the same styling changes in Unity UI, what we can do is first of all, hide text speaker. And then with text subtitles selected, I'll center the alignment and then get rid of the background by going to the panel object and disabling the image component. If we want to add an outline effect in Unity UI, we can do that by going back to our text subtitles object and adding the outline component. We can also make use of Text Mesh Pro, which is an optional package available in Unity's package manager. And the instructions to get it working with Adventure Creator can be found in the manual. Going back to the menu's properties, the position type has to be set separately when it comes to Unity UI. So I'll set it again from manual to above speaking character, and I'll remove the transition type as well. So if we now come out of prefab mode, and test this out again. We're now able to use Unity UI for our subtitles instead. If our game has voice actors, we can also make use of speech audio whenever characters speak, and we can configure all of this within the speech manager. In order for speech to have associated audio, we first need to have the speech manager gather it up and if we go down to the bottom, we have this game text panel, and this is where all of our game's text is listed. Right now, we have zero lines of text gathered. So if I click on gather text, it will go through our project and all of the scenes in our build, and we'll make a record of any text that appears in our game. So after running that, we now get a list of 77 lines of text, and we can use the filter options underneath to view them. If we click on one of these lines, we get more properties about it. So for example, I can click on nice place to sit and we can see what scene it appears in, who the speaker is and so on. We also have some fields for audio path and file name. And this means that if we have an audio clip named player135 and placed it in a subdirectory of our resources folder named speech, then that audio will be played automatically when the line is spoken. This isn't the only way we can map audio to speech. If we scroll up to speech audio, we have this reference speech files field, which by default is set to by naming convention. We could, for example, set this to by direct reference, 
and then back in the properties of the line, we could assign the audio clip directly. The most performant method though, is to rely on Unity's addressable system. And addressables are an optional package that we can import from the package manager. And details on how to use it with Adventure Creator can be found in the manual's speech audio chapter. Gathering up game text is not just limited to speech though. Uh, we also have hotspots, uh, dialogue options, and any text that might appear on screen. And so this allows us to also create translations. Just above the game text panel, we have one for languages, and I can create a new translation by clicking create new translation, and then give it a language such as French. And if we now go back down to one of our text lines and view its properties, you can see that we now have a text box for entering in a French translation. Languages also have their own properties. So for example, if our game was in Hebrew or Arabic, we could check reads right to left. And in the case that we haven't supplied a translation for a particular line, we can display a fallback language instead. As an example, I'll assign a French translation to the bench here. So if I set the type filter to hotspot and then keep the scene filter as new park, I can click on bench here and then set the French to bunk. At runtime, we can change our game's active language by going to the default pause menu and then options and then clicking on language. When it comes to properly translating a game though, it's not just a case of going through each line one by one. We can actually export all of our game's text to a spreadsheet. We can do this by clicking on export text, choosing which columns we want to export. So I'll create one with display text as the original, and then another one with French. Click export CSV and create a new CSV file. And this can then be exported into a spreadsheet updated and then imported by clicking the import text button, locating that file, and then choosing which columns we want to import. Well, that's about it for this tutorial. Thank you very much for watching and more tutorials can be found both video and text by going to Adventure Creator, Online Resources, and then Tutorials.